Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We're here in Squaw Valley, Lake Tahoe at the World Championships, and I could not be more excited about this guest. People always ask me what's my favorite interview, and this is going to be. Uh, Joe, you got to talk with Jimmy Chin, one of my heroes. This guy is unbelievable, one of the greatest the climbers in the world. The funny thing for me about it is uh, there was a Jimmy the Chin in New York growing up. Uh, he was a wise guy, so I always get the two confused, but there's no mistaking Jimmy Chin, the person we interviewed, um, put out a great documentary. I don't know how much you want to tell here before before we uh, we dive into this and let people watch it, but um, this guy is Superman. Yeah, ju- just this. If you followed anything about climbing, not only is he one of the great climbers, he is the great climbing filmmaker. He has documented some of the most incredible feats ever, including Alex Honnold's recent uh, solo free of the uh, El Cap, a movie coming out next year. But uh, Jimmy Chin, I'm so stoked about this. That's all I want to say. This Honestly, this is truly one of the great extreme sport personalities in the world right and here and i'm stoked about this podcast we have joe we got johnny myself <laughs> colonel and i and our producer and director marion so enjoy thanks for bailing me out you got you want to test his mic is his mic good all right yo yo we are here for spartan up podcast in central park with jimmy I call you Jimmy the Chin because, uh, you know, Vinny, Vinny the Chin, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Wise guy, grew up in Queens, bunch sure, of wise sure, guys. Sure. And, so, and you have a, a fear of heights. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've never been able to overcome it. It's just been this thing. And yeah. and because we could see it in a lot of the movies and stuff I've seen about you, you could see like the fear taking on. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, yeah, honestly, um, heights is probably the one thing I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have an issue with <laughs> Worried about. I've been habituated to uh, a vertical high angle life, so. Nice. That's one space I'm, I'm fair. Actually, if anything, that's probably like my safe space. <laughs> and, and you're a chain smoker? Because I've seen in the movie, you're like, you're smoking <laughs> like crazy. And I'm like, I don't get it. Well, you know, I mean, our uh, publicist um, trained us to say that it is a uh, appetite suppressant. Got it. Got it. All right. No, but I, I was I was curious about that. Like um, yeah. when you guys are out there. For those of you that don't know, he's a he's a famous climber, photographer, just all around superhuman. <laughs> how how would you describe yourself? Uh, I'd say I'm a filmmaker, photographer, and uh, you know I've been a professional climber and skier for the North Face and other uh, kind of brands for over. This would be my. 17th year on the North Face team. So, you know, I spent a lot of time in that space, uh, either being the talent, climbing and skiing, or working with uh, the top athletes in the outdoor industry, really, from snowboarding to skiing to climbing. And, you know, there's multiple disciplines within climbing. So uh, I've gotten to, to spend some time with some really incredible people. And, and so that's why it's so odd when I saw Maru is your famous, yeah. it's your famous documentary. You've got a bunch of them or is that, is that the yeah, big one? Yeah, that one's certainly the, you know, the biggest kind of film I've made. Um, M-E-R-U. M-E-R-U. M-E-R-U yeah. for those of you out there who haven't seen it. Yeah, and, and that, um, that had a big theatrical release. I think it was the highest grossing independent doc in 2015. So nice. it was, it was and I'm run. watching it and I don't know who you are and you're chain smoking. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't get it. Well, we're not necessarily chain smoking, but I would say that, you know, I mean... Marlboro Man thing? I, I, kind of like everything in moderation, including moderation, is, is one way I, I live. But in the mountains, on a climb like that, specifically, big wall climbing, coming out of Yosemite, there's a little bit of this bad boy like thing that um, that comes from my Yosemite days, but honestly, it is an appetite suppressant, and it's just more of the ritual of like rolling a cigarette with your partners and sharing it kind of. in these like moments. It's like it's a thing. It's a yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, in day-to-day life, none of us no, smoke. No interest. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, you look extremely fit, extremely healthy. So I, I yeah. had to, I had to ask the yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the occasional one here yeah. and there, you know. But I, I can't function. Yeah, if I 
smoked regularly, <laughs> that would be. And, and there's a, also expeditions where, I mean, you, like if you're going 8,000 meter type of peaks, obviously you're not, not smoking doing cigarettes. <laughs> so, and then there's this other thing I, yeah. I heard about. You're, uh, you're on top of Everest mm -hmm. and you pull out a pair of skis yeah. and decide to ski down. How, how do the people around you react, like with the oxygen masks and everything? Are you like, I just want to get to base camp quicker? Or yeah, well, I, you know, the thing about skiing Everest is uh, I made two attempts to ski it, one successful. Uh, I've also climbed it without, um, without skis. Uh, but really, you know, we pick uh, seasons where there's no other people on the mountain. So the two times that I went to try to ski it, we were trying to ski it in the monsoon season, the first time I tried and we were literally the only team on the mountain and we were doing it alpine style is what we call it uh, and kind of in the you know strange moral universe of climbing and big mountain climbing and in climbing in general style matters like how you do something is just as important as what you do sure so alpine style climbing is where you issue basically fixed ropes fixed camps no supplemental oxygen no sherpa support you start at the bottom you go to the top and it's the highest commitment style climbing um, and uh, but anyways we were the the only team on the mountain the only couple people on the mountain Got and it. then uh, we failed spectacularly which is you know as I'm sure you probably know failures are actually they're where good. you learn yeah, good. the most um, and and then I went back in 2004 climbed it during the regular season, basically looked at the whole mountain and realized it was definitely skiable. And then I went back in 2006, post monsoon, nobody there, just me and my team. And uh, yeah, two months of getting acclimated. And uh, when we got to the top, we were the only- People up there. Yeah, th well, and our Sherpa team. Yeah. Um, in 2006, I went, we went with a Sherpa team, an incredible team, and uh, I mean, they were basically like, don't do it, you know? <laughs> right, <sure. laughs> but... Uh, you had to do it. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a life goal, and I don't know, I had, I'd, I'd become obsessed with ski, skiing, and, and I thought I was, I thought I had a decent chance of, you know, doing it. I, 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 your odds were good. Survival was... Yeah, I over-prepared. You know, I was, like, prepared. By the time I tried it in 2006, I was prepared. When I had tried it in 2002 or 2003, my first attempt, I mean, I was pretty prepared for that, too, but we just had some... Just didn't work out. Yeah, yeah you don't know what the weather. Conditions, right? yeah. yeah. So, so the whole podcast, the, the, we're, in the, we're searching... Yeah. for what makes somebody successful. Right. It doesn't have to be monetarily successful. It's sure. you know, a mom, a monk, a mechanic, whatever it is you're, you're looking to achieve in life. Like, what are the attributes? What, how did you grow up? What were you taught? How did, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, no, so for sure. Embark. Uh, well, I actually, I grew up in like rural Minnesota, flatlands, or a little town called Mankato, university town. My parents were librarians there. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. I am like, I keep, I always like joke. I'm probably the only person out of Mankato to ski Everest. But um, my parents were immigrants and from China, and they, you know, made a life in the states, and they had some very high expectations for me. And I think, you know, looking back now, you know, reflecting on on the things that. My parents Legendary, really yeah. instilled in me it was just always from the very beginning was like excellence was the only option. Like if you're going to do something, it do was it, it always, well. yeah. you know, and that was just the way that I thought from the beginning. And I studied. Um, only child? No, two. My sister, older sister, uh, and she was incredible and yeah. still one of my best friends. Uh, and she a heart surgeon or brain surgeon or something? Or? Well, she was really smart. I mean, yeah. she went to Stanford coming out of like a school in Mankato sure. and then went on to study at Oxford and then was like, a, at, you know, worked at Yale for awesome. 16, 17 years. 
And then I was like the young, youngest, young little brother that like went off and like did crazy stuff. Did my own thing, but but from a very young age, you know, I studied martial arts from as long as I can remember, as far back as I can remember. My dad was training me in the martial arts, nice. and then what kind of martial arts? Uh, Chinese kung fu. But then I I I I think I might have been one of the youngest black belts in Taekwondo in Minnesota for, not that that's a big deal, but like, I remember them saying something like that sure. when I tested for it. I was 14, and so I took that pretty seriously, and I competed every weekend, and then I swam competitively, like, my whole... Tough sport. So I literally would sometimes go to two events a weekend, right. compete in martial arts, and then and then. How do, you not, how do you not get burnt out? I push my kids pretty hard. Everybody says you're going to burn them out, but it sounds like you're, you're at a whole lot. Uh, I did kind of get burned out, Hang but... On one second. Right. Yeah. Big old truck. I, I, I uh, brought in a kung fu master from China to start training my kids at oh, five years old. Oh, what kind? Um, so I was told, you know, yeah. you know better than me, but... Um, Praying mantis? That, no, that... The, now in China, you're yeah. not going to get those different types. It's yeah. just one style. Yeah. And that style is more like um, gymnastics. Yeah. And so whatever that is. Shaolin. Yeah. yeah like the, Shaolin. The most modern, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, they yeah. do in China. The that's iteration what, of yeah. it. Because it kind of combined all the different styles. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so, so uh, how do you not get burnt out? Uh, I, it was interesting because because I started so early and it was what I did... I, just normal. It was just normal. Like yeah. I swam. I mean, in the summertime, you'd swim three hours in the morning, and then you swim two hours at night. Right. That's just and then what you, you did. And then you, and then you, you know, did martial. You know, you practiced taekwondo, and then I played the violin since I was three and a half. My parents were like, on it, on yeah. it, and. Stop giving me a hard time. And this, this, this and, and, and and you know they didn't speak to me in. Uh, English. They wouldn't respond to me if I spoke to them Even in English. Even better. I'm so I grew this. up bilingual. Right. Parents still alive? Uh, my mo my father still is. My mom passed away ten years ago. Sorry about that. Yeah, she was she was incredible, and she brought like the creative side. My father was much more of like discipline. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting that you talk about burnout though, because I I did kind of start to get burned out, um, and funny enough. What I found was I found skiing, and I basically, if I did well in school, if I did well in you know competing and all these things, I got to go skiing. Got it. And then I fell in love with it. Yeah, that was I, something they weren't pushing. That's yeah, and it was wanted. mine. Right. And there were no rules. Right. And I could do whatever I wanted. And also, but it still you know had an edge. It had speed. It had all these different things. But I also, it was like an incentive for me to do well and other things. But, you know, as soon as I left for college, uh, you know, I started moving, you know, I stopped playing the violin, I picked up the guitar. Yeah. I Got stopped, yeah, yeah, I started yeah. skiing more, I found yeah. climbing. Got it. And then climbing really basically became uh, an So you didn't climb yeah. until college? Yeah, super late. You know, especially kids these days start when they're like. But you're super fit. You picked it up pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think martial arts or gymnastics right. or anything like that. If you have kind of your body awareness, it's really helpful. But sure. Yeah. So, um, so tell us about Alex. What's his name? Honnold. Yeah, Alex Honnold. Yeah. Uh, you just uh, were in Yosemite. I was just in Yosemite. Yeah. Uh, I've been working on a feature documentary with my wife Chai Vassarelli. Uh, and we were documenting his process to free solo El cap, and he did it. He did it, and there's there's a lot to talk about on it. Um, you don't have to you don't have to give it away because yeah, I know you got yeah, the documentary yeah. coming. But but uh, it's gonna be a very <laughs> interesting film, I think. Awesome. When's that come out? Uh, probably in the middle of 2018. Nice. Next year. Nice. So we yeah, got time. We're, we're cutting right now. We got now. time. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is is uh, the takeaways that the audience can get on, you know, what how they could apply some of the things you've done in your life to uh, become more successful, to just get after it and get it done. Like, 
people say, oh, I, I'm not motivated. How do I get motivated, Joe? Or, uh, yeah. you know, how do I know if I'm doing the right thing or I'm in the right relationship? Like, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough one. It's, well, it's tough in some ways and it's very easy in others um, to find a life with purpose and intention, I think. I mean, I think it's also harder to, to find it as you get older, but I've seen people do it where they just, usually there's some sort of event or something that causes people to push over into to, to pursuing a life that they've always dreamed of. But I mean, I'd say this, the biggest risk I ever took in my life was actually to go against the grain of my parents who did instill all of these incredible traits and um, philosophies within me. But when I broke off after college, you know, as far as I knew, you know, going into high school, college, you know, there was like three tracks of life. You could be a lawyer, you could be a doctor, you could be a business, you know, right. entrepreneur, right. executive or whatever, or professor, maybe four. Right. Um, and that was like really deeply ingrained for me. And then when I found climbing and I was like, this is, this is like an expression of who I am that is like, is, is like, it just made a deep impression on me. I knew that I loved climbing. And I mean, I certainly didn't think of it as a career. Right. In fact, you know, if you want to <laughs> make money, climbing, being a climbing bum is probably... <laughs> the worst thing you could do. Yeah, the yeah. worst thing you could do. Uh, and, and my parents were totally against it, like, because I moved into the back of my car when I was 21 after college. And I lived in, in that car till I was 28. I was like a homeless person for like seven so, years. So do you have to ask yourself the question, what would I do if I had all the money in the world? Like, is that... That's, that was one of them. And I was like, I'm doing it. Right. And, but I don't know. I mean, passion begets, you know, all kinds of things. Right. If you're passionate, right? Yeah. It just happens. Yeah. But the thing is, is people are always like, oh, you're so lucky you found it and you're so passionate about it. But I think it's important for people to know that, like, there was a lot of doubt all throughout whether I was making, like, the right decision, because it didn't necessarily make sense in all these different ways. Those cold nights in the car with no gas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were years when I was, I spent more time spooning with my climbing partner than any woman, you know, because you were, like, we, we're so not, committed. We could, we could cut that if you yeah. want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you just end up, like, on some alpine bivy ledge in the middle of the mountains, freezing your ass off and right. being, like, you know, why am I not hanging out, you know, in Manhattan at a bar with like tons of cute girls and I'm right. stuck on the side of this wall, sure. freezing, you know. But, um, but it's also just, you know, you have like a lot of existential questions as well. But you know, there is, there's always doubt when you take a risk for something that you believe in and are passionate about just because sure. there's that nagging sense of like, am I doing the right thing? Cause you're, it, you're, you're vulnerable. How do you know not to quit, not to pivot? How do you know when it's right and when it's wrong? See, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk to you about it just because I've been told I'm very stubborn from, very, from a lot of people. So I don't know if it's just I know or if I'm just stubborn. Sure. And, uh, you Can know, we, I, my, my skill within the climbing community, it's like there's so many great talented climbers the only thing I really can offer as a climber is like I can I can grind it out. I can kind of like I can suffer and I can put one step in fr you know foot in front of the other and sure. just like grind. Sure. Um, and that's kind of how I. It works until it doesn't. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. So you may never know. Yeah. Not you. I mean, all of us. We you just might not know. But if you're passionate about it and you love it, yeah, you stick to it. Well, it's. I mean, it's a gift if you find something that you're passionate about. Right. I mean, not everybody does. I think it's important to recognize that and follow your instincts. If you start, you know, if you find something that like moves you, that moves you. Right. And, and it's the search for that. And some people find it when they're younger, some people find it when they're older, but 
you're lucky if you find it, um, whatever that is, painting, climbing, you know, yeah. something that moves you. It's, uh, it's, you know, you're lucky to find it. All right, let's talk about pivoting, um, because uh, Ed Visters says, right, getting to the top is optional, getting down is mandatory. Yeah. And, and it's been a question um, for me for the last 20 years, and I'm sure the audience, like, um, there are times you're supposed to pivot. You said you're stubborn. You're three quarters of the way up Everest. Yeah. Storm rolls in. Timing's off. Yeah. You don't pivot. Yeah, you do. Uh, to you. Yeah, I do. It's yeah. funny because I climbed Everest with Ed in 2004. Right. Uh, he's a good friend, but most of what I do is actually risk management, like managing risk. At the end of the day, is like a huge part of sure. the job, and so. Um, I think in any world where, especially at the upper echelon of any world in business, finance, lawyer, being a lawyer, a doctor, a climber, it's understanding your environment, understanding the stakes, understanding the consequences, understanding the probabilities. Um, if you're really good, you're good at calculating risk at a very, very high level where you can take it as close to the edge without going over it. And that's what, that's what you do. But if you are at the edge and you make your evaluation of everything else, uh, I guess an actuary would call it exposure management. Right. It's like you, uh, you pivot and, and you have to be objective. You know, a lot of it, a lot of poor decisions are made when people have become emotional about the decision making. And, and you kind of have to like step outside of yourself and evaluate. Uh, it's hard to do because it feels happening. like quitting. It does feel like quitting. Right. But you know when the stakes are life and death, it's like, yeah, you... Well, one way to think of it in climbing, dying is bad style. <laughs> There you go. All right. So, Dying is bad style. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to die. Yeah, right. It's better to come back and quit right. than not, not make it back. So, I mean, yeah, th those are good questions. As you saw in Meru, you know, the first time we try it, we get up. Didn't work. We're, we're 100 meters from the summit. Right. And we turn around. Tough to turn around. Yeah. Really tough. Right. Every ounce of me wanted to keep going. Sure. And it's so contrary to this whole concept of, you know, Thomas Edison, 900 light bulbs on the 900, right? Yeah. Like, you don't quit. Uh, Winston Churchill, never, ever, ever yeah, give yeah, up. Yeah. And so, but there are times you're supposed to, and that's, yeah. that's the magic, yeah. knowing when, because not just climbing, just... No, in, everything. In, everything, yeah, yeah. right? I think in every field, especially when you start to examine people who are at the top of their field, yeah. You see, they're just, that's why I'm always interested in people's decision-making process when the stakes are that high. Like, sure. how, what, are, what are the factors that they're looking at um, to make the decisions that they're making? I, I interviewed a, a, a successful woman in Silicon Valley, and she said she likes to have a board of directors in her life, and she thinks everybody should have them. Yeah. And they should come from diverse backgrounds, and, yeah. and you should be able to lean on them. Now, mm -hmm. you're not going to pull out the cell phone on the side of a mountain, but, yeah. but objective views, yeah. right, from friends. Yeah, and, and in climbing, it's mentors. Right. You, you basically have a board of director of mentors like throughout your career, people who, if you're lucky, you get these great yeah. people who can kind of, you know, look at what you're doing, how you're doing it, give you objective feedback, um, and show you the way, really. Morning ritual, what do you got for a morning ritual? Um, Morning ritual. I like to sleep. I think sleep is important. Yeah. Um, but usually up, if I'm having a good day, if I'm not actually charging out the door to go climb or ski or something, uh, if it's like a work day, I try either way to get, wake up and do 20 minutes of meditation. And then I generally wake up and do, let's see, meditation. I have a morning smoothie routine. Nice. Uh, which is great. Um, I don't eat that much for, for breakfast, but... What's your smoothie? Smoothie is like, uh, let's see, frozen blueberries, yeah. just like a ton of <laughs> blueberries, yeah. 
antioxidants, uh, banana, uh, kale, yogurt, almond milk, Hana One, yeah. which is a botanical supplement. Awesome. Yeah, super good. Ashwagandha, yeah. uh, and that's that's about it. That's a good one. That's your morning breakfast, then. then yeah. what, like, what do you typically eat? What's lunch, dinner look like? You know, if I try just to kind of snack throughout the day, just like nuts and you know, hopefully healthy stuff, maybe salad during, and then dinner. I like to eat. So, yeah. I mean, I eat sure. pretty well. A lot of meat, or? I've been trying not to eat too much red meat, but um, yeah, it's pretty balanced. I mean, I'll probably have red meat once or, once or twice a week, fish, some nights just fully vegetarian. I'm not like... So so tight on it, yeah. Super tight, just and, and fitness, not over eating. Fitness routine, mostly climbing, or? Uh, climbing, skiing, hiking a lot in the winter, backcountry skiing. I do, I run in the summer, mountain bike. I do yoga. It's pretty broad spectrum. I'll work out in a gym here and there when I'm traveling, but. Um, the sweat. Sweat. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I'm, if I have a big trip coming up, I'll train pretty specifically. Sure. But I mean, big mountain days for me are the best type of training. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You're awesome. awesome. Thanks for coming yeah, out. Thank you. That was great. Jimmy was awesome, was I right? Excellence yeah. is the only option, Joe. <laughs> Excellence is the only option. I uh, Listening to him, I, I ran home immediately and told my wife, there is nothing I'm doing that's crazy with our children. Be or <laughs> the crazy that I'm doing with our children it will pay off. It will pay off yeah, because yeah. excellence, you have to play at that level, right? If you want to turn out to be amazing and, and excellence was the only option. Y y you do. I agree completely. And yet probably the hardest thing he said easily the hardest thing for him was when he finally had to channel that excellence in a way that his parents didn't approve of. Probably pretty hard for his parents who he was going to be a violinist. He was going to be a martial artist. He was going to be a swimmer. And suddenly he's doing something totally different, doesn't have a natural payoff in it. So as as the dad who is uh, Jimmy Chin's parents, you know, to, to your kids, um, what happens uh, 12 years from now when one of them says, none of the things I've been practicing I want to do, I want to do this totally different thing? Yeah, so what I've been doing, I've, I've been planning for that. And what I've been doing is giving them things that I don't really care if they follow through with and hoping <laughs> that then they do the... You're I'm not, you're secretly, not airing it's this, like right? reverse they psychology. They don't they know. They don't listen to this? <laughs> yeah, they don't know yet. It's like we're moving chess pieces around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Joe, you, you, we, we've talked about this before. It, it, it's exposure, right? So you expose them to as many things as possible and you kind of almost force feed them yeah. until they find that one thing they like, right? You make them eat all the vegetables until suddenly they decide they like broccoli. Correct. You know, so you've got to, so Jimmy was exposed early on and maybe forced, but exposed to multiple disciplines. So he had the training, it, he had the discipline so that when he decided to go down whatever path he was going down, he already had the background and the training to go ahead and develop and become a world-class whatever. And a work ethic, right? Work Isn't ethic, a work ethic correct. at the end. And, and what I would say is, the, the, like, the patterning, right? So the, what he says is, even though I was going against what my parents were telling me what to do, I'm using the same principles that they've instilled within me. It's like permaculture, which is a design principle for designing the landscape. You understand the patterns and principles in nature, and you apply it to whatever you're way. designing. I thought about that. See? Oh, they're starting to infiltrate them. What you guys are instilling in your kids is just like a certain baseline of how you approach things. It's like a, it's a philosophy, and then you can apply it to whatever it is that finally you find, well, like and, seeds. And, and, and as he said, you know, that he actually did start to hit burnout, and then he channeled it all into the skiing. Yeah. But, but you know, the, it, it, was, it was that same discipline, that same everything. It, it's funny when he said, um, he said being uh, from a traditional Asian family where they, you know, they expect you to be the very best. Um, it is something that, uh, that some cultures, and you've talked a lot about Eastern European cultures who don't take anything for granted because you're used to not having very much uh, from, sure. from the old days. Sure. And, um, and it, is, it is important in our privileged North American culture that we find ways to um, to still instill that kind of drive and that kind of motivation in our kids, um, even though they've been raised with a ton of advantages. And I, and I think that is a huge challenge when uh, when life is easy because your parents have done well. Um, yeah, we're not doing our. I don't think we're doing the kids any favors when we make life too easy. But the, an interesting thing for me, you know, Ed Vister's. Um, would say getting to the top of the mountain is optional. Getting down is mandatory. And and um, Jimmy touched on some of that. Yep. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Risk assessment. And yep. 
Saying dying's not 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 cool. I no, like no no you know he says, he says, he says that dying is poor form. Yeah, poor form. Or, <laughs> but no, but that's a really important point because like, what's the difference between striving for excellence and knowing when it's time to like have the awareness and have that risk assessment, which is a lot we have to do in the military. It's saying mm-hmm, like exactly we're not we're not going to f- execute this because there's not going to be any other mission that we're going to be able to go on if we do it. The thing that impressed me a lot about him is, I guess you see it. You can go two ways, right? When you're kind of the best at something, you, you can be the quiet, confident guy, or you could be the arrogant guy. He he was clearly just quiet confidence, right? He he didn't even seem to want to talk about like, I mean, he could have talked more about himself. Right? Oh, I was I was pull, did, I was definitely pulling. You, yeah, he wasn't you pushing. had to work a little bit hard just to get him to kind of admit that he had done some pretty cool things in his life. You know, I mean, so I, it's um, yeah, he was really just kind of laid back, calm, quiet. And you can kind of see why maybe he's good at things. I think he approaches it very methodically. Even if he's doing wild things, you know, if, if you're skiing or, or, or if you're climbing or whatever, that would seem to be something out of control, but not really, right? You can't be out of control and do those things. Well, there's another another principle of permaculture that says use pato, which is protracted and thoughtful observation. Like, whatever you're doing, do an assessment and, like, look at the full scheme of things and have the intelligence and the experience because you, you take great responsibility when you're taking people up on a mountain or through a race or in a job or in business, whatever you're doing. It's a lot of responsibility to lead people, and you should have the awareness and the knowledge to be putting yourself in that position. Uh, another co- interesting part of the conversation, and you were sort of pushing at the start, and I thought it was, I was trying to figure out where you're going with it, when you're talking about the smoking. Uh, but I did love that he said, because, Tobacco you know, because it, it, clearly we're not advocating smoking. Um, but I loved when he talked about, you know what, when we do it on the mountain, and it's coming down for a big climb, and it's bonding. And we're, we're not just, you know, tearing the cellophane off a pack of Marlboros and throwing it in the wind. We're, we're sitting there, and we're rolling, like you say, a sacred tobacco, basically, to share amongst themselves. A long lineage of that tradition. And, um, and and I and I did love when he said uh, all things in moderation, including moderation. I've always said including moderation. I think moderation can be exactly. over moderated, yeah. but um, but but just the idea that that so many things that we think are inherently good or bad, it it's what what's the context for it? Sure. You know, um, four guys who've just climbed a mountain sharing a cigarette on the way down that they've rolled and uh, and and it's a it's a um, ritual is very very different than being a smoker. Agreed. With that said, everybody should go out there and watch Maru if you haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, Maru, M E R U, I believe. Amazing documentary. And where can they find us? Well, you can find us. Uh, we have some unbelievable guests coming up. You really have to check it out. Don't miss any of these episodes. It's spartan.com slash podcast. Check it out on iTunes or YouTube. Make sure you subscribe because that way you get them all coming to you. Um, we, we love being here every week, and we love hearing the feedback. So uh, interact with us, uh, comment, share with your friends. Thanks so much. Does, wait, before you go off, does Jimmy have a charity? He did because not. if not, I'm not sure, I am Jimmy sure, I am sure <laughs> Jimmy would su- support Special Ops Survivors. Yes. SpecialOpsSurvivors.com. Love it. Thank you for watching another epic story of success. If you like our message, please share Spartan Up with your friends and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you catch our show, maybe in the woods. Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com.